Okay, welcome. And thank you so much for joining me today, Pam. This is the Untapped Gold Mines uh, podcast series. For those of you listening in, you can find this series on untappedgoldmines.com as well as a search on YouTube uh, for Untapped Gold Mines and uh, my name online, CJ Depardine. I'm you know, I try to create as many breadcrumbs as I can to find whatever you're looking for. And today I am extremely blessed and excited, very, very excited to speak with Pam Dukes. Um, Pam is a really fantastic human being that I've been introduced to through um, a mutual connection of ours. And uh, I'd like to just jump over to Pam's bio to not mess anything up. Um, but one of the things that I, I, admire most about Pam is that Pam is actually a Hall of Fame and Olympic athlete who focused on helping teams through servant leadership and self-reliance strategies. She's passionate about learning and helping others as a coach and a trainer. She's been a featured speaker at several agile and lean conferences and loves her experiences with others. With over 20 years in the technology industry, she uses agile practices as her experience with high performing teams to improve team productivity deliver high value products and her superpowers are her optimism empathy finding ways to view and conquer challenges while motivating those around her Pam is also a proud graduate of Stanford University and at Stanford she majored in sociology with a focus on organizational behavior and has earned both a master's and bachelor's of arts and I think this is why Pam you and I are probably so um, great to connect with each other because of our passion for, you know, humanity and just all the wonderful things that, you know, people are capable of. And I'd love to just pause there for a moment and ask if I missed anything, if you want to clarify anything, if I kind of misquoted in any way, shape or form. Uh, no, thank you very much, CJ, for that wonderful intro and for having me. And no, you haven't missed a thing. Sometimes oh. I listen to people talk about me. I just kind of think, huh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think you did a good job. Nice. Right. And on that note, I remember looking up one of your uh, talks on the Harada method. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember your introduction talking about how you had this history of like not acknowledging yourself or the greatness within you and that's changed so i'd love to just start with that and actually say like how did you untap that confidence and that appreciation for self because so many people and i mean all the way up to the c-suite because i coach many in that area um so many people have this like inherent blocker when it comes to like really believing in self and being super confident in self. So tell me a little bit about that backstory. Sure. Um, one thing I, I guess I had done after I'd retired from my sport and eventually I'd been in the workforce is at some point I must have had experiences where people found out my history. So they found out I went to Stanford or I was an Olympic athlete. And at first, it's really cool. Ooh, let's, let's go talk to her. But then after a while, it felt almost like, you know, the lunch invitations, the happy hours, they all just kind of started to disappear. And somehow in my brain, I equated, well, because of the information they have on you, they have decided, you know, well, we, we don't want to be around you because your stars may be shining too bright. We're going to kind of go over here. So the message to me was, you know what, let's just not tell anyone about that. Let's just be, you know, Pam, technology person, and not give them any of my history. And it was kind of easy before there was such great search capabilities where people could find out about you. But I did that for years. And I did it so long, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And when I did um, take that Harada Method class, there's a lot of things you have to do. You start rating yourself in categories and... I realized that the ratings I had were really low and I noticed the students around me were higher. And I started wondering, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm supposed to be kind of good. Why are my numbers not so high? So as I kept digging deeper, I realized that I had kind of wiped the slate clean of all my accomplishments because I felt that's how I have to show up to get along and be part of the group. And so 
you know, after years of doing it, I was kind of horrified that I had done that. And I realized, okay, I'm done with that. And I even um, one of my mentors, our mutual acquaintance, I remember when I told him, you know, I was working on a, a module to do for his training. And I told him, you know, I think I'm going to link, link, link the Olympic thing with uh, something with scrum. And he looked at me like, Olympic thing? What are you talking about? He had no idea. <laughs> so oh, wow. Thought, it was, you know, he kind of looked at me funny. And I thought, well, how could you not know? And then I realized, well, I, could, I haven't been telling anybody. So as I delve, dug deeper, I realized, okay, it's not just me that's minimizing my accomplishments. A lot of people do this. And there's a quote that I saw where people are confusing sharing and bragging. And what it says is sharing says, you know, hey, I'm good at something and that's okay. But bragging is when you cross the line and say, I'm better than you. And a lot of people in their brain, whenever they share about themselves, they hear bragging. It's always bragging. And since they don't want people to think they're better, then they don't share. And one of the things I do in my Harada Method class, the first exercise is I tell them to write on a sheet of paper your biggest accomplishment and, you know, okay, tape it to your chest and we're going to wear it. And I ask them how they feel. And you can just see the cringing. And I say, right. well, what's, what's going on? And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I don't want my family to think I'm so great or I don't want people to know. And I said, well, what if I told you to wear it all day and go to the grocery store? And they're horrified. And so it just proves my point that somehow, first of all, we're so concerned about what the world thinks of us that we can't even share who we are. And secondly, it wasn't just me, it's everybody. And I finally kind of get them to see, you really need to own your accomplishments. And the reality is there are gonna be people out there who don't like you no matter what, who may think you're showboating. But for the most part, most of the people will be excited and proud and help lift you. And those who kind of, you know, treat you a certain way, they're not in your corner anyway. Why are you trying to please them? So when you have that realization, I think for me, I step forward and I see my students step forward and realize, okay, I can do this because I have awards and trophies and things. And they were in the garage, CJ, in the garage, oh. in a box. And right. I decided, you know what? Not doing that again. So now they're all on my wall. When you first walk in the house, you, there's no doubt that you know about what I've accomplished. And, you know, I've taken the pride back. So that is sort of kind of what's happened for me and what I'm trying to teach others that, that, that we're all doing this and let's stop because it's crazy. Right. So I love that you said that you're taking the pride back because so much of the work that I do when I'm coaching individuals um, it's almost as though that pride is so buried and mm -hmm. so much so that like the idea of even thinking about how would I feel if I was proud of who I was and walked proudly with that feeling. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like, it's an unattainable feeling. So can you share what it should feel like, what you've witnessed it starting to feel like for others when they take pride in who they are? Like, what are the benefits of taking pride in who you are and what you've accomplished? Well, I think once you, you kind of show the world who you are, the world kind of meets you and they decide, hey, I want you to help. I want you to do things. Will you come speak to our people? Would you put together a presentation? Will you coach me? People reach out. Can you tell me how I can get better? And from a lot of it, it's, it's not that they don't have confidence. It's just that they're afraid to show it. Mm. And I, I think the thing that disappoints me the most as it's more prone for women to have this problem. Yeah. And so I have to work that angle and say, you know, there's a lot of strong women out there. So find a strong woman that you really admire and see what she does and try to emulate her. And I tell people that you can see how you carry yourself and how you show up every day, how you show up to a meeting, how you show up to a room. It's, it speaks volumes about you. And you, you've got to realize that and realize everywhere you go, everything you do, you are introducing yourself or showing up to the world. And when you have a certain swagger or even a little bit of confidence, people notice, and I've met people and, and I've had opportunities just based on general conversation. I've gotten jobs from people that I used to work out with. I mean, we just happened to say, you know, what do you do? Oh, you know, I'm in charge of a software company. Oh, really? You know, I'm a project manager. Do you need one? Well, actually we do. And then poof, it just happens. So right. I, I, I feel it's, it's, we really do ourselves a disservice if we work so hard to, to get something or get somewhere, but then feel like we can't use that to our advantage. So like you said, I'm trying to use my superpowers 
to help me and to show people that you should use your superpowers. A lot of people don't know their superpower. And I tell them, if I spend enough time with you, I can figure out your superpower. But I tell them, when I tell you your superpower, you know what you're gonna say? Oh no, I'm not that great at that. Oh no, no, no. Guess what? You're gonna minimize it. Because yeah. you, even though you have it, you still feel like what you have is not good enough. And there are other people are better. Well, yeah, other people are better, but you're pretty doggone good. And we need to capitalize on this. So I just feel like it's so important for people to stop hiding and minimizing and, and take risks and try things and awaken that creativity. Because once you do, there's just this feeling that you have when you wake up every day and you wonder, well, what am I going to do today? What new ideas am I going to have? What am I going to try? And it makes life so much more enjoyable. So I tell them, don't, don't worry about the people who don't like you or don't care. Have a set of people that you know will tell you the truth and will support you and encourage you and work with them and all the other voices you just need to shut out. Right. And it's really interesting that you talk about that at this time that we're at in the world, because we've got a lot of people who, um, and I would say we've got multiple buckets of kind of people that, you know, are experiencing the world differently today. And we've got some people that, you know, their job was who they were and their job is no longer the same. They have to reinvent. We have some people whose job really wasn't who they were, but now what they are used to is no longer available to them because, you know, at the time of this recording, we've got a pandemic going on. We've got the civil rights movement around the Black Lives Matter. Um, campaigning and and of course elections coming up in the United States and so there's a lot of kind of observation that we are required to do in the world today and inner reflection that we're required to do and I think a lot of that leads to reinvention and so I'd like to chat with you a little bit about you know that transition from you know Olympic sports into business and of course you're your degrees come from sociology and organizational behavior. So I, I would assume that that transition was prepared for and smooth for you. Um, but how does that kind of connect to any of the transitions and changes you've had to experience today in this new world, if at all? <laughs> this is a loaded question. I know. So, so first of all, you are not correct. It was not a smooth transition. Oh, okay. I think, I think people think when they know that you're an elite athlete or that you, you're an Olympic athlete, that somehow you come back and you retire and then life is smooth sailing, doors are open, people can't wait to work. with you. Yeah, no, it, it's not really that way. You are still competing with everyone else, the people who've stayed focused more on their careers. Mm -hmm. And so you are still trying to compete with them. And there was a time when, when I came back into the workforce so when I'm, before I uh, actually retired, I was still training for the Olympics. I didn't tell anybody I was training for the Olympics. And my fear was that because during those times of layoffs and so forth, if they told our department or our manager that they had to let some people go, they would look down the list and see my name and say, oh, you know, Pam's got that Olympic thing she trained for. She doesn't need this job. And my name would get a check next to it and nothing could be further from the truth because the only way I was able to train was because I supported myself full time. Right. So yet, it's another thing I hid from people because I wanted to, you know, just be on the same level as everybody else, not doing anything interesting. If someone said, you know, you look really fit or something, you know, I would try to cover it up and say, you know, I work out in the evenings, you know, try to make no big deal about it. Um, but the transition to regular life without the sport is difficult because like most people, you're defined by what you do. That's how you see yourself. And at the time, you know, I was an athlete or an Olympic athlete. And when you take that away, you feel lost. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I, I saw recently was Michael Phelps HBO special called The Weight of Gold. And he talks about athletes and the level of depression they suffer because all their life they've been focused on this one thing. And they define themselves by this one thing. And when you take it away, what is left? And, and where are all the social groups that you're supposed to be a part of to that you can just go you know, participate in? You don't really have any because you've gotten rid of a lot of all those extracurricular activities because all you've done is train. And right. the reason I like his, his documentary because it really talks about how difficult it is to come back to normal life. You know, you're not 
coming back and every, you know, the parade's over. It's time for you to get back in the real world. And a lot of athletes go through depression and the simulation is difficult. And I know for me, I had done track for over 15 years. I couldn't even think of track. I couldn't watch it on TV. I couldn't go watch kids compete. I had to cut it off because it was almost like a death. A part of me died when I had to stop competing. And as I watched, you know, the, the documentary, I see, oh, okay, it wasn't just me. <laughs> Michael Phelps has even gone through this. And we know how popular he is and how many medals. But he chronicles all kinds of athletes. And the most difficult thing to watch and see in that show is not only do a lot of athletes suffer from depression, but they take their own lives, CJ, yeah. as a result. And to think, you know, they're sort of screaming out to their governing bodies and others to help them because psychologically, they don't know how to work through this. So um, I think for me, because I always worked in technology and I was part of a team, I was able to continue and it made it a little bit easier, but it was definitely difficult. And it took me years before I could even watch track and field or I could even tell people what I did because it was such a big loss for me. Mm. Um, I think others, you know, anytime you have to change what you're doing or maybe you've had a layoff or something and now you're trying to redefine yourself or figure out what's next, it's difficult and we all face challenges, but I think for me, what I try to do is recognize that you still have to keep getting up. You still have to keep trying and everyone goes through difficulties. And sometimes there are some silver linings where you think, you know, this is what I've always done and now I have to pivot and do this. And this may turn into something else that you might enjoy, or it might actually be a good change for you. But the biggest thing is that when you're going through difficult times, you have to stay on some level optimistic. You've got to find some optimism and you've got to find coaches and mentors around you who will help support you. Because I feel we all need people and it's the folks who suffer the most who don't have a support system or family or, or mentors or coaching to help them get through the hard time. So if there are people out there who are going through, as you've mentioned, the difficult time, maybe they've lost their job to find another, find another job. Don't give up. Try to work on how you perceive the situation and just know that it's going to get better. But but staying sad or getting depressed or not trying is just not really an option that's going to work in your favor. So you've just got to find a way to get through this and recognize that around the corner, there should be some opportunity. And, and as you mentioned, hopefully the pandemic will, will get a lot better. And you also mentioned um, the racial tensions. And I, um, it's funny, I never really talked about this with anybody. I just kind of kept it to myself. And now I've seen a lot more people, they've made it safe to talk about our experiences and what we've gone through. And it's only because of that that I feel like I can talk about it. And I was so motivated by what I've seen and, and the events that have happened to a lot of African-American men and women that I actually put in to join our, a, our diversity and inclusion task force for my company. And normally I would have never done that. I would have said, okay, well, let someone else handle that. I'm just gonna stay over here. But because of what I've seen and because I realize, you know, I don't want to be silent anymore and I want to have a voice where I can actually help make a difference and change, you know, what's going on in our organization, how we help people and encourage and support those who are trying to make a change. Because as a parent now, you know, I have a son. And so I'm having to have conversations about things with him that, you know, I feel like it's unfortunate, but I don't have a choice. I need to let him know that. You know, if you're in a situation, here's what you need to do and make sure that when you're out of this house that you carry yourself a certain way and, you know, there's no talking back, there's no anything. You just have to be on your best behavior. And if you have any problems at all, you need to tell me because I'm here to help support you. So um, I kind of feel like I'm in the right place at the right time to make some differences and make some changes. So I, I feel grateful for that. And I do work with some people, try to help coach them and motivate them. So I feel blessed that for some reason, what I say seems to make a difference for people. And I'm just grateful that I can kind of pay it forward because that's what people have done for me all my life. They've coached me, they've motivated me, they've spoke greatness into me. And so it's my turn to now pay that forward and, and hopefully help others. Right. Like and that really long answers for you. No, no, no. This is fantastic. This is all about you. And this is about introducing okay. you to, you know, the, the people that might be listening to this podcast um, and really letting people understand 
where the untapped gold mines are in our lives. And you've said a couple of things in that um, response that I, I want to call out again. Like there are some people, whether they, you know, have had to completely switch identities with like their careers or just with what's going on in the world, or they've been forced to like really reevaluate it can be extremely hard. The transition is not smooth. We acknowledge that. There's people like yourself out there to support people in that world. I know that you provide coaching and mentorship and uh, team training as well. Um, but one of the things that you said that I think is, is really important and a good reminder for people is that sometimes just getting out of bed is like the first step. You can't stay in bed. You can't stay down. Um, I imagine... Um, that with your background in athletics, that like not giving up is, is a requirement of the job, right? Um, so you have, it, it's entrained in you, I would imagine, to kind of really keep pushing forward. But for those who don't have that, like that strength or that fortitude or that back, that type of background, how do we encourage them? And, and I'm, thinking about this whole kind of subject matter that we just spoke about or that you just spoke about everything from, you know, you're changing your careers to you are now seeing what's happening in the world around, you know, the civil rights and, and black lives matter movement. Um, we can't give up because if we give up, none of these things are going to move forward. Our careers aren't going to move forward the progress that we really need to make on the systemic, you know, oppression and, and racism and all of that is not going to change. And so how do you find that fight within you? And I would even go as far as saying, even in the workplace, if the workplace is proving itself to be really difficult, you're being forced to do your work despite being like really weighed down by what's going on in the world. How do we keep fighting? What are some of the things that you know, you learned to untap within yourself over the years and to help others untap? Um, <clears throat> I think for me, I think a lot of it comes from my family and my upbringing. Um, my grandmother, my aunts, in particular, my mom, I was raised by some really strong and powerful women. So I got to witness it, what it was like to take care of their job, take care of their family, support their friends um and these are friends i know my mom has friends she's had since she was in her teens and it amazes me to see that level of support and strength and in my brain i tell myself well you know you come from them so you don't really have any excuses you know you're not dealing with what they had to deal with in the civil rights movement or in the job market so i almost I don't allow myself to use that as an excuse and I remind myself where I come from. So that's one of my motivations um, as a parent. I know that when you are a parent, everything you do is watched and you are constantly role modeling what it's like to be an adult. So that's something I take very seriously. And it's not that I try to be strong all the time because there are times where I'm tired or just not feeling well and I take a break, but I try to, make sure I am role modeling the kind of behavior I want to instill in my son and other family members so that they recognize that even in, you know, difficult times, you still have to get up and go. Um, and I compare what I'm going through or what we're going through now, again, to what my family and my grandparents went through. And it's almost night and day because what they went through is so horrific. It's hard for my brain to even comprehend. Yeah. So the way I look at it is that with every generation, there are really difficult struggles and, and uh, hardships that you've got to conquer. But you sort of have to lean on the folks who paved the way for you to be where you are and recognize that, you know, life is not easy and you're going to come up with difficult things. And you, you just have to find a way to feel better and to motivate yourself. And I know for me, um, I've learned that what you put in or take in has an effect on you. So mm -hmm. one of the things I do is I'm very specific. I find specific podcasts or YouTube shows or books or anything like that, that teach me and, and help me get better and feel better. Um, 
And if I'm ever not feeling so great, I can just put that on and feel better. I listen to a lot of motivational speakers because, you know, sometimes, you know, it's Monday morning and it's seven o'clock and you're on a call and that's super early, <laughs> but you may not feel like it. So I may put on some Les Brown or Brene Brown or any Brown or just listening <laughs> to them. Um, I know Michelle Obama has her own podcast now. And so there are all these things that I get joy out of. I listen to Angela Duckworth, who actually taught a class I took on grit. She's a psycho a psychology professor at the University of Penn. And now she has a podcast. So now I've got all these different areas I can pull from and learn. And it's weird. It's like when I'm listening to them, I feel like this inner peace. I feel calm. Mm. And sometimes I'll write something down and go, oh, that's a great idea. And then now I will go do something that they suggested. So I think you have to figure out what fuels you and surround yourself with that. Of course, being a mom, you know, I love spending time with my son and sometimes just being in his presence, I feel better because I just think, you know, people say, you know, your greatest accomplishment is where you went to school or your fact that you're an Olympic athlete. And I laugh because I just think, no, he is my greatest accomplishment. And I get to spend time with him every day and he'll come. We learn from each other. We have rabbits and things in our backyard. We feed the birds. So we get to go and watch that. And sometimes it's just the little things that I feel like I can take joy from. And I, I use those to sort of fill myself back up. Um, but that's what works for me. I think as individuals, you have to figure out what it is. And even before we went into the, the year with the pandemic, I decided, you know, you're going to do some pretty cool things this year. I don't know what they are, but you're just going to do them. You're not going to say no, you're going to say yes. And so I started with, uh, I did an interview show called Showing Up with Pam. And I mm -hmm. wanted to give back to the people who had helped me. So I do an interview and we kind of chit chat. And that's been fun. And then one day I was coming out of the shower and I said, you know what? I need to do a podcast. There's so much stuff that we're overcoming in life, not just what you're going through now, but whether it's bullying or um, weight disorders or all kinds of stuff. And I said, people sometimes look at me and think I've had this charmed life and I haven't had difficulty and things to overcome. Well, I'm going to let them know that's not the case. So I started the podcast and the very first podcast I did was overcoming um, sensitivity and um, taking things personal. I got taking things personal and how you shouldn't do it from the four agreements. And my mom gave me that book. And I see that all around me, people taking everything personally. And I'm just trying to give the book out, like read this chapter, read this chapter, read this chapter. <laughs> it helped me so much. And right. maybe in, in real times of strife, you take more things personal and you get more sad and you feel like it's all happening to you. And just by knowing that, nope, that's not really what's happening. So if you can at least language what's going on in your head and the voice to know, no, it's not that way. It's actually this way. You can make yourself feel better. And one of the things I said in 2020, I said, you know what? I want to look back at the end of this year and not even recognize myself. And that's my new goal. So now all the things I'm trying and doing, some work, some don't work. It doesn't even matter. I just want to look back and think, wow, that was pretty cool. Now, what am I going to do next year, regardless of what happens in the world? I don't want the world to gauge what I do. I want me to gauge what I do. Right. So that's kind of how I do it. And that's amazing. I mean, there's so many great things in that. And I think a couple of things like finding the little stuff. We really underestimate how powerful the little stuff is. And I remember when the pandemic first hit and it was like, everybody's on lockdown across the entire globe. I'm like, what are we going to do? We started playing backyard games. I started watching the garden grow for the first time in my entire life. And I was like, this is actually quite enjoyable. Like, and I'm getting into this idea of like, I can plant a seed and it will grow in front of me and I can see it. And I saw lots of parallels to that and just making life choices, planting seeds, trying new things. Some of the plants just don't grow and that's okay. But like you said, even with like some of the things in life that we try, they may not all work out, but we have to keep trying. Right. And that's about resilience. Um, You've mentioned a couple of times uh, coaching and mentoring, and I definitely, I, I think there's a, a long stack of um, 
intel on the web about what coaching is, what mentoring is. And I think there's a lot of like confusion about what it is. Um, and it sounds like through your podcast, you get mentorship, like those that you listen to, you just get indirect mentorship from Brene Brown, Les Brown, um, whomever it is that you follow. But can you explain a little bit about um, what coaching and mentoring, what the differences are for you and why either or both of them might be useful for people who are in this situation where they, you know, they're reinventing and they're, you know, trying to create an, a new self that they're not going to recognize by the end of the year or whatever it is and, and be proud of that. So how does coaching and mentoring play a role and what are the differences? Ooh, I hope I get this right. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, mentoring, I, I look at it, there probably there's a lot of similarities. So for example, someone may reach out to me on LinkedIn and say that they want to be a scrum master, which is something that I'm familiar with. And they'll ask me if I'll mentor them. And assuming I have the time, I'll say yes. So I'll take a look at their resume and we'll have a couple conversations and I'll ask them kind of why and what they're trying to do. And then, you know, unfortunately for some, I think what they will do is go get a certification. So they'll go take a class and pass the test and suddenly they're this person and now they want to get a job. And particularly in this time when people are trying to find so many jobs, most jobs want experience. So you don't just get to flip the script and announce yourself to the world and say, come hire me. It doesn't work that way. Many people I know were part of organizations who went through a transformation from Waterfall to Agile or Scrum, and you kind of converted to the role. And that is how I got my experience. That happened to me three times. So... Mm -hmm. I was fortunate because I was kind of put in the role and I stayed there. So I kept getting years of experience. So one of the things I try to tell them is it's going to be hard for you to just walk in and get that job. But what you can do is if you're part of any other organization where you can help them improve and maybe make their work visible and use some of the techniques you do with Agile and Scrum, then you can actually list that on your resume as having had that experience. Um, and then I tell them maybe there's where you're working now, they could, a different department could benefit from going through some of those techniques and tips and you could be their scrum master. So you sort of have to get creative at how you can get experience without just walking into the job. And I've noticed for some, they expect, you know, the magic pill that I'm gonna say here, if you take this pill, you will get the job or I can just recommend you to get the job. And I don't think they realize that for some, you have to sort of take time and earn your stripes to get there. You know, yeah. folks want stuff instantly. I want the job. I want to get the promotion. And, you know, to me, life doesn't work that way. You have to really put in the time and get the recognition before those doors open. So I tell them not to be discouraged, but I also try to tell them to be a little realistic, that it's rare that they will just bring you in because you have the certification. You're going to have to do some legwork and be at the right place at the right time. And I, I ask them, like, well, are you networking? Are you on LinkedIn? You know, I live on LinkedIn. It is my social media. And right. if I look at their profile and it's got the blue background, I'll tell them, okay, people say that you shouldn't have that because that's an indication of recruiters that you're not on here much. So they won't even try to contact you. So change that. And again, I'm no expert. I just learned that from reading about, you know, things you can do on LinkedIn. So if anything, I just try to encourage them, but know that, you know, you've got a little bit of a difficult road here. So don't, don't think, you know, I have a magic pill for you, but know that you're going to have to get creative to get there. Um, so that's how I look at mentorship, someone who's trying to get somewhere and I'm trying to give them the tools. Coaching is different for me. And, and I'm fortunate because I've had some fantastic, amazing coaches. I still have coaches in my life. And one of the thing I would tell everyone out there who can listen to this is that everyone needs a coach. And if you don't have at least one or two people either in higher ranking positions or similar or wherever, that you speak to regularly and share ideas and they motivate you and they give you things that you can get better, you need to find one. And you can find coaches all over. But I think coaching makes the difference because when, when we're in school or when we're in sports, we have coaches. But in life, when you get out and you're out in the real world, you don't. And I, I didn't realize that until it, it took me a while to figure out, okay, I'm not doing as well as I could. And the thing that's missing is a coach. So as soon mm -hmm. as I got a coach, I started flying because I work real well with coaches. So I tell people, if you don't have a coach, invest some time and, and, and money in doing that if you can. The way I try to coach people 
is I try to kind of step back and see where they are. And there's different techniques where they tell you to ask a lot of questions and let them sort of figure it out. Most of the coaching I do, they don't, I don't do that. Because, you know, I just think we, we don't have all day to get to the solution. I'll just be honest with you. I'll do some of that. But in the end, they want me to give them guidance on what they can do to get better. They don't want to figure it out on their own. They want me to tell them. And I'm perfectly fine with saying, you know, if I were you, I might try A, B, and C. Or maybe there's some things you could do here. Um, and I'd like to think that I, that makes me a little bit more effective because I help them get to what they need to do quickly. And once you get that little bit of success, then you've built the trust and they will come back and say, okay, well, what else do you think? Um, I'm fortunate, at least in my industry, where I've gone from project manager to scrum master to senior scrum master to coach. So I know what the level of work takes in each of them. And I can spot pretty quickly where someone is and tell them, you know, all right, you want me to be completely honest? You want me to hit you through the eyes with this one? Okay. You're pretty much coasting. Yeah. You're at 1.0. You're doing your job description. You're facilitating those events. You're showing up but you're not really taking it to the next level. You're not innovating. You're not using some other techniques. You're not trying to make your team self-reliant and self-organizing so they don't need you anymore. Because the goal is not to be busy and be in everything. The goal is to teach them how to do it on their own so you can support them in other ways. And you know, I was talking with a couple of people, including my boss, where she recognizes your goal is to work yourself out of a job. That's literally what you're trying to do. You're not trying to make them dependent on you. You're trying to make it so they can handle it, where if you go away for a few weeks, they are fine. And I don't think people recognize that. I think the new fun thing is the busy. I'm real busy. I'm busy doing all this stuff. And, you know, that's not the way I think it should be and others think it should be. You should teach them how they can do it on their own. And then if there's other teams that need you, you can go help them. You're not stuck with this one team because they can't do anything. And to me, it seems so obvious, and maybe it's my sports background, because I had a, a coach at Stanford who taught me exactly that, to be more independent and to handle competing on my own, because if he wasn't around, he didn't want me crumbling in a competition. He wanted me to know, you know what to do, go do it. And so I take that same mindset in, into the workplace, and that is what I see coaching as, teaching people to get the teams or whomever they're working with to be self-sufficient and able to do things on their own. Right. And it sounds like a, a big part of that is that first step where you're really observing this person and kind of getting to know what they have in them and what they don't have in them and helping them identify the, the areas of opportunity where maybe there are some blind spots and that may even be blind spots related to their teams. But how beautiful is it to do that plus create this idea that you should be constantly evolving and changing. Like this idea of fixed mindset versus growth mindset is always like, it's a bit of a sticking point for me because I am so about change that like I truly, I, like I can't function if I'm not looking at what the next kind of evolution of me is. Um, and I kind of look to the people that I lead or support in the same way. And so it sounds like, you know, the, the core difference, if I can, kind of sum up what you said between mentorship and coaching for you is, you know, one on the mentorship side is like, here's some tools, go try them. Here's some techniques, go try them and see what works for you. And on the coaching side, it's like, here's your unique situation and here's your unique approach. Have you considered these things? Have you tried these things? What are you going to do to get here? Right. And it's really about accountability on that person's kind of side of things. Um, that so, was really good. Yeah, <laughs> I, took it, I took it from you. Um, so I just kind I'm of summarizing. Everywhere I go, I'm taking CJ with me. Really <laughs> no, I'm just summarize, summarizing what you, what you said, because I think it's really important that we understand the differences between the two and the value of the two. And like you said, there's definitely some gray areas and similarities between them. Um, but I know that you know, because you play both roles uh, and you also work with organizations, you work with teams and you, you know, use the Harada method and maybe others. Um, there's so many tools in the toolkit. So I'd like to just make a transition to say, like, what are the tools that you have kind of 
learned to believe are really, really fabulous to help untap people? Um, and why are they so useful? Why have you become a big fan of them? So the biggest thing, and this is the biggest takeaway that I've gotten from the Harada method, is the accountability factor. And one of the things that it teaches you is you set a goal, and then you set some areas of tasks and routines to help you hit the goal. Um, and you focus on all of you. So you do mind, body, and spirit. So it's not just a professional, I'm focused on work stuff or something at home. You kind of want to work on all of you at the same time in addition to that piece. Uh, but the biggest takeaway is you work with a coach. And one of the things that I recognized when I started this was I'm a little high maintenance, so I need more than a coach. So I had like six or seven people that I, that I kept um, signing up to coach me and then giving them updates regularly and being accountable to them. Because I realized you will let yourself down every day, but depending on who you pick as a coach, you are not going to let them down. And for me, one of the people I picked was my boss at the time. And I just did not want in any way for him to not think I could do stuff. I'm just going to get this done. So he thinks I'm great. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think that really helped me. And one of the things I've taught my students is you have to be particular in who you pick as a coach. Because say if you're married, for example, and you pick your spouse, that's fine. But the thing you have to realize is that's the one person who may let you off the hook because say you've had a really hard week and you know, you're supposed to do these things to meet your goal. And they might say, oh, you know what? You've had a hard week. Well, let's just work on it next week. Right. And, and they've let you off the hook. And, and that's not what you want. You need someone who's going to say, why haven't I heard from you? All right, well, let's make sure you get that to me by the end of the day. I mean, you need to hold that line. And it, the accountability is so key. I, I tell folks, pick someone who is going to nag you until you get it done and whom you don't want to let down. Because if you strategically pick, pick people who are like, oh, you know, whatever you get to it is cool. That's exactly what you will do. So you've got to get the people who push you over the edge where you can hit the goal. Um, that's the biggest thing, I think. And then also, you know, is it Eisenhower who said plans are worthless, planning is everything. So keep, keep working the plan. You know, as soon as you make the plan, the next day it might be obsolete. So tweak it and find ways to make it better. And don't just say, okay, I'm going to read so many books this year. I'm going to read five pages a day. And then if you skip a day, say, okay, well, maybe I'll read five pages every three days or something and just keep making it easier for yourself because then you won't hit your goal. So you've got to make it to where you're going to hit the goal and make it a little bit of a stretch, but not something where, oh my gosh, you just start to lose faith and you just feel like you can't do it. Give an example, say someone wants to lose weight. So if the first day you're on this plan to eat more healthy and you do really well, and then at dinner you have a cookie, you don't just go off of everything and for the next three days, just eat pizza. You just say, okay, I had a little slip up. That's fine. Let's start again tomorrow and let's see how we do. You're constantly continuing and not letting something derail your plan and trying to stay, you know, in focus and heading for the goal. I think those are the biggest things for me, setting the goals, making sure people around me know so they will hold me accountable. And you have to be careful because if you give the example like, okay, I'm going to try to lose some weight. People around you, even though they don't mean to, will sabotage you and buy donuts the next day. And you realize, why did you do that? You know, I can't eat donuts. <laughs> so right. You, you, you've got to be careful at how you share and what you do. And then you've really got to work on that mental part of your mind where something clicks and says, okay, I have now pivoted and I'm not going to do that anymore. And for some, it can take a while to get there. You know, when maybe doctors have said to someone, you need to lose weight and they don't listen. But then maybe they go and then the doctor says, look, if you don't lose weight, you won't be here next year. Maybe that's the conversation where you bing, all of a sudden something's clicked in my brain and now I'm doing what I need to do. So I would say try to work on that mental part too. And you can read books. There's techniques out there. There are things you can do where you just set the bar and then you just don't allow yourself to move away from it. And I know it's easy for me because I had to do it in my sports. I had to sacrifice right. a lot and tunnel vision and I don't see anything else. So I can flip the switch sometimes, but I think people are capable of doing it. You just have to find the way to get there and not let yourself off the hook. We have a tendency to let ourselves off the hook. Oh, you know, it's COVID time, so it's hard. So let's not push ourselves, let's go easy. It's like, no, I'm not using that as an excuse. There's always gonna be something. 
that can derail you. So don't let that get you out and off of your path. Right. Yeah. And like you said, easier said than done for some. Um, but I, th I think the key is to aim for something. Like, right. even if, you know, we, we look back at the earlier part of our conversation, if aiming to get out of bed every day is the mm -hmm. goal, mm -hmm. do that, right? Yep. Small incremental steps may be the best way for somebody to work towards a bigger goal. Is like Absolutely. breaking it down into bite-sized pieces and doing a sprint cycle and, exactly. you know, maybe working their way upwards towards mm -hmm. it. Um, I know that with goal setting, like some people feel like you've got to set this like big, hairy, audacious goal and like mm -hmm. let yourself down every single day along the way to that goal where maybe it is about like what is reasonable today. Mm -hmm. And then what is reasonable after you've achieved that? And what is reasonable after you've achieved that? And I think that's, you know, a, a comfortable place to be, especially when we also have to give ourselves kind of the, the permission to be human at the same time, right? Because we are balancing this kind of sense of like, I'm going to perform, but I'm also going to acknowledge that I am you know, dealing with constant change or whatever it is I'm dealing with today uh, that might get in the way, but I'm going to get back on track. Even Wolf of Wall Street, like they had the straight line concept. Like if you deviate from it, you still have to get back on the line. Um, so it's a pretty great analogy and, and concept. So in closing, because I know we're, we're at time, we're coming, coming up to time here. If there's mm -hmm. one thing that leaders should be thinking about that you don't see them thinking about enough in terms of untapping, you know, themselves or untapping their teams in closing today, what would that be? I don't know if I could say it's one thing. I would definitely say it's two things. One of the things I like to see in leadership, one of course is empathy. Empathy is really important and you can yeah. spot easily somebody who doesn't have any empathy. So I find that empathy is big. And then that fear of admitting failure, you know, I think when someone can admit, you know, even in an interview, sometimes we have questions and say, tell me about a time when you failed and what have you learned? And I'm just kind of thinking in my brain, I'm like, okay, which time? Because I got about 30. <laughs> All right. <laughs> which one should I tell him today? Um, but um, being able to know that the people you, you report to or that, you, that are leading have failed and have learned from it and aren't ashamed or afraid to tell you that. It just makes them so much more human and you can connect with them and you feel like, oh, they're just like me. And I, I think the goal with anyone is to feel like you have some commonality and you're similar to that person. If you feel like they're way over here and I'm way over here, there's this huge connection problem. But when right. you feel that they, they're just like you, you know, they've done goofy things and had issues and so forth. It just makes everything so much easier. And you almost feel like, when you arrive, your shoulders are up and you're kind of tense. But after you hear that connection point and, and the empathy, your shoulders go down and you relax. And then you can have a, a better and, and a, a human type of conversation and connection. So I would say those, those two things are, that's what I look for. That's what I like to see. That's right. That's what helps yeah. And that's beautiful. And I remember, I might've even said this on another show before. I remember a leader once saying to me, I can't be vulnerable and admit my failures because it'll be a sign of weakness and they won't believe in me and they won't look to me as their leader. What would you say to that person? You know, thinking about acknowledging all of who you are, how do we kind of close with that? Well, I think it's because we're all people and we're all human and it's ridiculous to think that people haven't failed. And if you're trying to go about life and showing yourself as this perfect, you know, never had a failure in your life, then people can't relate to you and they can't respond to you. And they may start just not listening to you because they don't even believe you're real. So if you want to be someone who can actually relate to everyone in your organization, throughout your teams and, and so forth, you've got to show that you're human. And the way we show we're human is we tell some silly stuff we've done. We tell some failure. And inevitably, once you, you know, admit to something like that, people start chiming in and sharing their stories and what they've gone through. And you now have that connection where you, you know something about them and, and they know something about you. And it just makes you feel better. 
So right. I would say that we have to get much more comfortable at admitting things like that, at sharing when we've fallen and when we, how we've gotten up and just, you know, making folks feel that I'm just like you. And, right. you know, let's figure out how we can help each other and, and help our organizations or whatever we're working towards. Because, you know, I just, I think it's so important to recognize, even as an organization where we failed, maybe two years ago, we invested in some technology, we spent this much money, and we lost this much money. And it was horrific. Just hearing that makes me feel, okay, that's good, because I've made some mistakes and some stuff. So. Right. I may not have spent that much money, but just <laughs> You can be more yourself. You can let your hair down and kind of share a little more as opposed to have the wall up and, you know, I can't share or show up and let people know who I am. So I would yeah. say the more human you can appear, the better it's going to be. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. And what a great way to end the session. So thank you so much, Pam, for all of your time, your wisdom, for being who you are and just being that support person for others. I know that you have, you've got a website, you've got a podcast and you've got showing up with Pam. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just call out and, and I will put the links on the website, any properties, any places that people can go to, to learn more about you today? The best place to learn for me is my LinkedIn profile. So connect okay. with me on LinkedIn and that's Pamela Dukes. And I think the letters O-L-Y will appear up. So that's shortcut, yeah. uh, short for Olympian. So that's the number one place I spend all my time. I also have a new website that I'm finishing up. It's not completely done. I just need to add my podcast to it, but it is called 40percent.org and you actually spell out 40. And the reason I named that uh, 40% was because I, I learned from a class on happiness that there was this formula where they say that about 50% of how you feel in your happiness comes from genetics. So, you know, you get it from your parents. 40% comes from kind of how you feel about um, things that you take in. So your reaction to things. And then 10% is, you know, you, you go outside, you have a flat tire. So, you know, what are you going to do? It just happens. And for me, it's that 40% that I'm constantly working on. I'm trying to constantly fill myself with good things that bring me joy so that I can maintain the level of optimism and happiness that I have. So that was a really long answer for what my website is. No, uh, you know what? And that's fantastic because I, I've been to that website and I, I, like I read the text that kind of explains it, but I think that that's a really remarkable thing to kind of highlight is that like, there are things that are going to be inherently out of our control. They're biological or they're just environmental. And what we can control is that 40%. And so exactly. your coaching, your mentoring, your team support, it sounds like it kind of focuses in on that 40%, which is fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, CJ. Thank you as well. And if there are any other resources that Pam and I share along the way, I'll add them to uh, the web page on untapped gold mines for Pam. And again, thank you, Pam, for all your wonderful wisdom. And I will chat with you again soon. And thank you for all who are listening in. And please leave comments where you see this, because those comments help me know that this is actually a value to you. And that's important. So thank you again. Thank you.